blue light. Let it be the night you catch me in a blue glow, your small face in my phone as we lie in different beds and I find myself wanting the warm ritual of your chest. This isn't the first time with you. We move quickly, darken our rooms. We are gentle, hands moving in slick pixels until pixels make way for your slow sleeping breaths. When we finish, I'm alone. The room dark and humming with memories of men asking to see my face, my face cubist in the computer light. I could be 13 seeing for the first time the growing darkness beneath a waistband, what laid like a knife between cloth and skin, the milky torso, the stubble climbing down his neck like gray matter. It's never enough to smile at the camera and ask his name. I'm always opening my mouth to say more raising my phone to capture it in blue, my legs shaking as I watch that acrid hand of his flicker, not unlike yours, up and down, begging me to hit send. Looking for Now is a collection of paired paintings and poems and conversation that attempts to conceptualize queerness of the past decade and capture how the experience of queer male youth intersects with the rise of digital media. Poetic predecessors have centered on violent resistance, love and hiding, and the scar of the AIDS epidemic. These themes are present in the collection, as they are for queer men today, but looking for now extends beyond periods of survival. In both verse and paint, figures grapple with intimacy, the internet, exploration, and challenging experiences in the community of men who love men. The collection consists of around 20 poems in free verse and received form and 10 4x4 or 2x4 inch gouache paintings. In deciding how I wanted to capture my own progression through queer identity and love between men, poetry was the first mode of communication and discipline I imagined incorporating. Poetry appeals to me through the associations and resonances it creates in language. I cherish the way poets manipulate language and image to retell and create a sense of narrative without the expository chunks common in fiction. After a good poem, even without a visibly written narrative, I have a feeling of arrival, like I've arrived somewhere new, having read the poem. In Blue Light, read earlier from the collection, I make use of formal techniques, macro gestures like lineation and stancification, and micro gestures like image, metaphor, and sonics. In the poem, the speaker examines the parallel experiences of their past and present selves. The poem is written in tercets, a stanza form that creates a forward momentum due to the odd number of lines. In the first few stanzas, the speaker describes their long-distance lover. The ritual he tells is underscored by the sonics. In the third stanza, sentences and clauses are separated every few syllables. We are gentle, echoes of the rhythm of we move quickly in the line prior. The parallel rhythm creates a sense of steadiness or reliability. Between the third and fourth stanza, the chiastic unfolding of pixels creates an inhale and exhale as the moment passes. The third line of the fourth stanza is dissonant, as the speaker declares, I am alone. The poem pivots into a melancholy tone. The dark room, which was previously darkened with excitement, has been redefined by the partner's sudden absence, their missing warmth. The language and imagery that follow are more jagged, violent as the speaker recalls harmful digital encounters of their youth. The speaker's cubist face creates angles and contrasts between light and dark. The knife and gray matter are unsettling images in the latter half of the poem and add a language of dissection as the speaker's body is dissected online. In the penultimate stanza, each line contains an active verb, opening, raising, shaking, these verbs are dynamic and ambiguous, but possess a nervous energy. The final stanza, with the acrid hand and the gesture back to the you of the poem, tie the present and past together. The speaker is captured in the middle of the act, taking photos of their nude body, watching a stranger masturbate. They become a body on a screen. Beyond intrapoem elements, poetry also appealed to me for the relationship poems can have with each other. 
A poem can have one meaning as an isolated block of text on the page, and by merely placing it beside a poem on the next page, connections are drawn between the two. The entire collection visits many themes and experiences in queer male culture while maintaining a sense of progression and arrival by the end of the collection. Poems can share motifs and titles and communicate with each other. The ordering in a collection can create a sense of narrative. In Looking for Now, there is a chronological sense of narrative, as the poems move from childhood to adulthood. Ultimately, poetry allows for many experiences to be told, and its separation between speaker and poet allows fiction to enter the work. The connection between poetry and visual art is long-standing. People have paired poems with art to create a conversation between the two, and there is an entire genre of poetry in response to and in conversation with art called ekphrasis. While my collection does include a couple of ekphrastic poems, the interdisciplinary nature of the project extends beyond a call and response. It is response, conversation, contradiction, and simultaneity. The visual art in my collection are standalone pieces that confront similar topics as the poems. Colors referenced in the poetry influence the colors in my paintings and digital pieces. However, the paintings also serve as inspiration for my poetry, like a self-ekphrasis. Visual art, like poetry, as a discipline is centered on conveying emotions, experiences, and ideas. In both, the artist crafts the visual image they want the viewer to witness. Using visual art allows me to isolate objects and scenes that are central to my experience. Bodies, sex, phones, pixels, and nudes. The art fills in the gaps in narrative and space that the poem cannot efficiently communicate. They force the reader to confront those scenes and interpret the many different emotional and intellectual subjects that are evoked. Beyond the visual communication, the aspect of making is central as well. Just as the pieces I include in the collection will evoke emotions and thoughts either of disgust, joy, sadness, I experience those emotions as the artist. Remembering, imagining, and reflecting acts as inspiration for the poetry and inspiration for the art. In this way, there is a connection between the disciplines both in Genesis and in the final product. Creating this project, I took inspiration from many artists and poets. Salman Tour, a Pakistani artist based in New York whose work centers on brown queer men in the metropolis. His lush green interiors, dancing men, and nude figures are intimate and unconstrained and hint at the violence outside those closed doors. Jeremy Cerise, a cartoonist from Brooklyn whose work often includes men's bodies in ambiguous but intimate scenes. In the poetry, I respond to a queer tradition of many poets, but there are specific ones I draw from and revisit when writing. They function as a base of queer male tropes and history that I draw from, subvert, and renew in ways authentic to my own experience. Carl Phillips, his poem Neon about cruising that begins with the line, a boy walks out into a grayish distance and he never comes back. Randall Mann, whose work centers on club culture, sex, drag, and AIDS, writes in the fall of 1992, I redid my face in the bar bathroom, above the urinal trough. I liked it rough. From behind the stall, Lady Pearl slurred the words, don't hold out for love. Lastly, Richie Hoffman, whose work served as inspiration for renewing the gay tropes of poetry as he threads classics, antiquity, and myth with queer male desire and yearning. In his poem, Mummified Bird, the speaker, a mummified bird, is killed once his pharaoh dies. If there is a soul, I don't think it can let go of such splendor, his silent mouth, his brain like mine outside of him, though he walks now in another place, in another perfect body, with a new wife to love him. This collection came about because of a desire to document a moment in queer culture. It seems that every three years there is a shift in attitudes towards queer people. I was in high school when same-sex dates still weren't allowed at some school proms. I had YouTube coming out videos and only a few queer young adult fiction books to silently celebrate my identity. My sexuality unraveled online and in digital spaces. A queer group chat the summer after my sophomore year, pornography, the gay quizzes on Buzzfeed. My experience entering the queer community from four years of silent hiding aligned with my return to the Bay Area for college. San Francisco is especially present in the collection. Multiple poems discuss my experiences there. First, from when I was 15, the summer gay marriage was legalized and I was dating a girl, though I knew I wanted to be dating a boy. 
Then years later, one summer on a date when a man stopped outside Golden Gate Park to call me and the boy I was with a slur. Even with freedom to express desire, something else lurks. There are discourse and pocket conversations that happen every day about hypersexualization, unsafe encounters starting early in youth, loneliness, depression, body dysmorphia, commodification, homophobia, and grooming. But these conversations rarely converge, and most often they end with commiseration and nothing is born of the deep introspective and communal reflection. No one ever does anything with it. I wanted to bundle it up into a complicated narrative. Looking for now is a love letter to my former self and a warning sign. It is about the lost time when one silently hides for years, the drive we have for the digital to avoid the contingencies of the flesh, and the last resort the digital serves when we have access to nothing else.